<clears throat> All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I know I am kind of late out the gate this morning. I promised 11 yesterday, but um, my homework took a little longer than expected. So, got that done. We're here now. So let's enjoy the show. I'm your host, Alex Blackburn of The Burn KC. Welcome. Um, got a few things to cover. It'll be a shorter one just because I have to go work my day job in less than an hour. Um, but we'll be all right. I've showered and everything such as that. So just got to get into work clothing and go. Um, yeah. Gonna be that kind of day, just kind of a front-loaded day is all, but evening is gonna be nice and chill, so. Um, but let's just kind of jump into it here. Um, the Chiefs. So, let's talk about how the Chiefs did last night. Um, just to get started with something that's fresh in all of our heads here. Um, Chiefs look good, offensively. Um, they really had a great turnaround. Um and Patrick Mahomes looked a lot more in sync with his receivers. Uh, the run game looked physical and tough um, with a couple really good runs um, against a really good Tampa Bay defense. Um, the Tampa Bay defense really did not look like themselves last night, I feel like. they they. I know that they've been dealing with a couple of injuries, but they, they really did not look like this juggernaut defense that... Um, they're kind of known for. Um, obviously, they have Brady as well, but it's that defense that wins them football games, really. Um, but it, it, I heard Chris Collinsworth say something, which is this is pretty much one of the only times I'll I'll quote Chris Collinsworth. Um. But he said something along the lines of the Bucks have just looked all right through the season. They have either their offense do a decent job, their defense do a decent job, or they're both, or either one are bad. Um, never really a great performance from any of the Bucks, and that really kind of showed last night. Um, you know their their offense was fine, but that defense just did not look like the Bucks defense. And I don't know if it's just because they couldn't get to Patrick Mahomes. I mean, he, he, Patrick Mahomes was hurried, but as you, most of you know, with Patrick Mahomes, when he's hurried, that doesn't mean a thing. Um, the guy can still complete absolutely unreal passes like he did last night with that little jump pass that he had um i mean that was insane watching that that was super cool i thought he had got flipped upside down and he threw it for a second and i was like how did that happen um but th that's how fast that play was was it, it was just throws the ball and immediately gets hit um but yeah, seriously, that was the play of the game for sure. Um, oh, excuse me. But, other than that, the defense looked decent. They did not look good, but they looked decent. And I think part of the reason they didn't look quote-unquote good um, is because of the penalties. I mean, it, we're still having penalties... Uh, excuse me, penalty trouble defensively, and it's gotta, it's gotta rectify itself, um, because otherwise you're gonna be dealing with a lot of inconveniences and even penalties that will cost you the game, like we saw with the Colts. Um, it, this is a very physical defense. This is a very fast defense. But it's a young defense and fairly undisciplined. And someone, as the older crowd, has to step up and be a leader. Um, that was really one of the only reasons I liked Tyron Matthews, because he 
did he stood up and was a leader. Um, that being said, you're not seeing that with this Chiefs group. I mean, you've got leadership by committee for sure. I mean, Chris Jones, Nick Bolton, um, Frank Clark to a degree. Um, excuse me, sorry. I thought I got plenty of sleep, jeez. Um, but guys like that, that aren't stepping into their leadership roles, but are rather working together on on leadership. And while that may work to a degree, sometimes it takes, I don't know, we, we've kind of had a leadership issue on defense for quite some time. Um, Tyron couldn't get it done. And it's looking like this, gosh, this committee that they got is not getting it done either, per se. Um, our defense has looked good the past couple games um, against the Colts, aside from the penalties, again. Um, and against the Cardinals um, as well. We've looked fine. It's a matter of fines not good enough to win a Super Bowl. And once we limit the penalties, I really feel like the Chiefs are going to soar. Um, because we've got talent on both sides of the ball, and we can make plays on both sides of the ball. Um, so, in the end, our kicker did not miss any kicks. Thank you, Matthew Wright. And the defense held firm and made the plays when they needed to. Just got to limit the penalties. And then the offense was spectacular. Um, Yeah, there were a couple missed plays, like that Clyde drop. But, I mean, we put up 41 points against one of the best defenses in the NFL. Um, So I I would say that's, that's a pretty big feat. Speaking of, though, and I know I talked about them Saturday, but speaking of explosive offenses and defenses that are good but need to limit the penalties and need to practice discipline, the Kansas Jayhawks are ranked. The Kansas football Jayhawks are ranked. Folks, that's a... That's something I've been waiting to, to, to say for a long time. Um, AP poll, coaches poll, both came out. Uh, coaches poll, they're ranked 17th. AP poll, they're ranked 19th. And they look good. I mean, they look like they want to win football games, that, they're, that they have that morale. Um that, you know, Jayhawk teams of years past didn't really have, um, especially with the coaching staff. Um, I think Lance Leipold has done a spectacular job at motivating these guys and he himself being motivated as well um, to make this team better and to make this team something to be reckoned with. And uh, boy, howdy, they've gotten there. Um, I don't think anyone's going to overlook the Jayhawks anymore. Um, which is a good and bad thing. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're going into a battle with TCU on college game day and TCU waxed Oklahoma. I mean, absolutely throttled them. Uh, and they're, and they're undefeated as well. Um, what, what I'm saying is the Jayhawks are getting into the bulk of big 12 play and, uh, what happened against Iowa State can't happen against teams like Oklahoma, like TCU, um, like Baylor, like Texas. It simply can't. Um, you've got to play disciplined, I don't want to say mistake-free, but the miscues that did happen, they need to be rectified, and they need to make sure that they don't happen again. Um, I understand Daniel Heishaw got injured on this fumble, but it's... Uh, 
it's a matter of ball security. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, there were plenty of other mistakes other than that. Um, 14 11 is not an explosive offense that, and I get it, you guys were playing the best defense in the nation um, as, as a group, uh, best defense per nation, or excuse me, best defense in the nation. Jeez. Um, but it's still, you still have to limit the miscues. I mean, the Jayhawks could have won by three touchdowns. Um, but instead, it's kind of winning by three. Like, it's a win. It's an ugly win. But that that kind of play is not going to fly against TCU. Um, but I'm sure, I'm sure Coach Leipold has a few tricks up his sleeve to... Excuse me. Make sure those mistakes do not happen again. Um, to make sure that it's mistake-free football. Um, obviously, mistakes limited, not mistakes prevented outright. You know, that there's no way you can do that. Um, not everybody's perfect, but I feel better about this TCU game knowing that, number one, their defense is worse than Iowa State's, but number two, knowing that Lance Leipold is at the helm of this football team. I mean, he's a great coach, and he's going to make sure that this team cleans up the penalties, this team cleans up the miscues, um, and overall just is prepared to face the big boys of the Big 12. Um, and that starts with TCU. That's that really starts with TCU. Um, they again, they have a very, very good offense and a defense uh, pretty similar to the Jayhawks' defense. They make plays, um, but every now and then they'll give up that big play. And what we have to rely on is that big play. And Jalen. Daniels did not look entirely on target um, against Iowa State. Uh, he made a couple really good passes, but there needs to be more accuracy with those throws. Um, and he's got time to work on it this week. I'm sure he'll be really honing his craft uh, to make sure that they can go up against this TCU secondary and not have a whole lot of issues. Um, I, I have full faith in the KU offensive line. They're a great unit. Uh, I know that they allowed a sack or two on, on Saturday, but they're still a decent enough unit to make sure Jalen Daniels has time to either A, find his target, or B, find a lane to run. And that's all we can really ask for um, with a dual threat QB like Jalen Daniels. I mean, again, he's drawn Lamar Jackson comparisons and is in the Heisman running. So it's, again, I know it's early, but it's, it's not a far off comparison. I mean, the kid's only 19 years old. He's got plenty of time to work on his craft. And I think come his senior year, he's going to be forced. If he's already a force now, he's going to be a force come his senior year. Um, but we'll just have to wait and see. Um, TCU versus KU is going to be on college game day. I am going to try to be there. Um, we'll see what kind of happens, what cut, what shakes out. Um but I'm really hoping to be there at some point. Um, and overall, I, I have faith that since we're at home, it, it yeah, I, I think we'll be fine. We just got to play Jayhawk football. So um, moving on, however, to high school football. Um, I know I kind of, Locked off on the week four rankings and week three. Um, I don't think I had a week three. I'm not sure. 
I may have. Actually, I think I did. I did. I did. Never mind. Um, so that week four is just missing. But that week four was awful important um, because, man, where the rankings shook up a bit. Quite a bit, I might add. Um, you may have noticed that Oak Park has made an appearance, that uh, Gardner Edgerton has made an appearance in the rankings. And there's a few teams that have and St. Pius has made into the rankings. There's a few teams that have fallen out, though. Um, and unfortunately, my Park Hill South Panthers are one of them. Um, it's not a knock against their program or anything like that. It's just a matter of we have leaps and bounds better football than we did 10 years ago um, in the Mocan area. And it really shows with some of these kids. Um, there's, there's plenty of four-star recruits in the Missouri area that guys that have committed to Alabama, even, um, like Edric Hill from NKC or, um, you know, guys that have committed to Clemson, to Notre Dame, to, uh, it's, you see the talent, and this is why I included those player rankings and those players to watch, is because you see a lot of talent coming out of this area. I mean, it's not limited to states like Texas, like California, like um, the Northeastern states, like Georgia, Louisiana, um, and the Deep South, Florida. Um there's plenty of talent here in the Midwest area. And uh, I think really the only big name college that has known that for some time is Kansas state. Um, I think Kansas state does a great job in locally recruiting, especially in Kansas. Um, and that's a challenge for the Jayhawks for sure. Um, but Kansas has been doing it since the early Snyder era and it's had leaps and bounds of success. Um, and then Missouri, they draw from the St. Louis area, but they hardly pay attention to the Kansas City area, I feel like, or at least until recently. Um, and uh, there's gems here. I mean, there truly is. Uh, guys like Isaiah Simmons that have moved up into the pros. Uh, guys like Elijah Lee um, and others that have shown that they're an NFL caliber talent and maybe not at this point in high school um, but have the ability to be an NFL caliber talent um, and they're commanding your respect um, so I, I really hope to see the growth of MoCam football I really do um, I I feel like it'll grow leaps and bounds over the coming years, um, more than it's already grown. Um, and you might see guys that, you know, go to Alabama, rock it, and then go to the NFL more often than not around here. So I'm making predictions that may or may not come true. I don't know how much attention Nick Saban <laughs> pays attention to this area, but I know guys like Lance Leipold, guys like um, Chris Klineman, and guys like Eli Drinkwitz are all paying attention down here. Um, and it's about time because, frankly speaking, those are the local schools. They should have been doing it in the first place. But recruiting being what it is, you got your pipeline states and you got states that pro just are factories for football players um, and I certainly hope that the Mocan area can turn into one because we've got talent here it's yeah so but uh, let me see here Liberty North is still number one far away um, there are independent or excuse me no that's not the right word um they 
are exceptionally good. Um, I, I don't see anybody beating them this year. Um, they're that good. Um, just based on the film that I've watched and the, the general consensus around the state even that this Liberty North team may run the table. So that, that has not changed. Um, everybody else below them, it feels like has, um, we've got a lot of shakeup going, go check out that article. If you want to see the full rankings, um, Carney's the biggest story in my, in my perspective, Carney's one of the biggest stories of the year. Um, after all the trouble that they went through, after the turnover that they had um, at that program, and just all the turmoil, and they're coming out firing, and they're the eighth-ranked team right now um, in the Mocan area, and that's that's not something to gawk at, or that's not something to to scoff at. They are commanding your respect, like I said. Um, and these kids want to win, it looks like. And they want to win for this new coach to make sure that this coach stays, I'm sure. And that there's no issues. And they're showing a lot of resiliency in the face of a lot of turmoil. So kudos to them. The kids didn't do anything wrong. Uh, the adults that are there now didn't do anything wrong. Um so you just hope to see a quick recovery for that program. Um, but overall, I, I, I really enjoyed the Carney Bulldog story. So anyways, moving on to Kansas, excuse me, to Blues Rugby. Blues Rugby um, took the field on Saturday. Uh, Blues Rugby D3 did against the St. Louis Royal Ramblers. Um, tough, hard-fought match all the way around. The first and second half were night and day um, in terms of offensive production. Unfortunately, they still did lose. Um, but it showed, again, resiliency and toughness of this Blues program to make a difference and to get the win. Um, because you had a lot of guys out there that were competing for Division One roster spots. Um, come, come next Saturday or this coming Saturday now, um, against against Metropolis, which is one of the better teams in the league. Um, they did lose to Wisconsin, um, a team the Blues beat pretty handily, um, but. There's still going to be a lot of work left to do um, this week in order to determine what that roster is going to look like uh, to get that big win over Metropolis. I mean, that's that's all important right now is to get that big win because it would give the season a, a trend in the right direction. Um, so far, it's been more or less a just okay season. I mean, the Blues are... The Blues lost a couple people, a couple key contributors um, last year, but they also gained a few as well. And this this Blues team, led by Derek Pearson, um, is going to be a team to be reckoned with in the next couple of years for sure. Um, and it would really help if they were a team to be reckoned with these next uh, the the couple years in between that and this year. Um, and I think they have the ability to do that. I think we have the talent and the resources to be up there with teams like Chicago, like St. Louis, like other teams such as that. Um, it's just a matter of putting those resources to good use. Um, and uh, the player pool that the Blues have right now is a lot better than a lot of people think it is. Um, and it's really only going to take a little bit of development about two to three years before 
a couple of those guys come big name talents on D1. Um, there's a lot of potential, and you've got to work off that potential. So, um, as for October 8th, the game's in Minneapolis, so there's going to be a bit of a bit of travel lag, I'm sure. Um, but overall, the Blues will be prepared, I feel like. And I think after this past Saturday's game, there's a bit more sense of direction as to where the coaches are going to go with the roster. Um, you had a couple of great performances from Ryan Ellison, um, from Tristan Searcy. Uh, the, the back line did really well. And, and, of course, the Ford pack really picked it up once um, they realized, okay, you know, we, we got to do it. So that's that's kind of it for Blues Rugby right now. Um, I will mention, however, as fundraising chair again. Um, Blues Raffle is going around. It's going to be $20 a ticket, um, $1,000 grand prize, I, th- I believe. Yeah, that's $1,000 grand prize. Um, just attend the banquet at the... Uh, um, for Don Bosco, excuse me, uh, before Black Friday, that's when we're gonna have it. It's it, that's when we have the drawing. It'll be a lot of fun. There will be food, drink, all you, all you can ask for, in in a good party for to support a good cause. Um, if you don't know anything about Don Bosco, uh, it's a charity that goes around to the underserved of Kansas City. And helps this specifically, this um, charity specifically, helps in buying toys for kids that, you know, may not get a Christmas present this year um, because their parents can't afford it. Um, It provides food, drink, um, and just kind of a hand up for these, for these people. Um, And anything that you can give really helps. Um, and furthering both the underserved of the Kansas City community and uh, the Blues charitable efforts. And I, I've always said we're a 501c3, so we we got to act like it. And this is one of the instances where we act like it. And we want to give back to the community. Um, so if you can participate, um, even if it's just your time, just... Just give back to a good cause, you know, for the kids, for the kids. Um, but now, actually moving on to a topic that I have gotten a little bit more details on. I think there's going to be a little bit more details released throughout the week. Um, but we may have a heading as to when the time is um, for the Kansas City Current playoff matchup. So, let me make sure I'm getting my dates right here. I gotta gotta look at it real quick. Hmm. It may not. No, oh, shoot. They dropped out of the top four. Um, so they won't get the. Uh, shoot, they won't get home field advantage. Um, so they're the fifth seed right now, and they'll face the fourth seed Houston Dash um, in the quarterfinals. And it'll be in Houston, PNC Stadium, October 16th at 4 p.m. Um, and I I did not see that. I thought that they had won last night. Uh, I guess not. Um, is what it is. I believe these ladies can still get things done and go far in the playoffs. Um, they look really, really good um, from what I've seen and from just the general consensus around the NWSL. Um, they're a team to be reckoned with, and they're not a team to be taken lightly. Um, and I truly, honestly hope that they can go far in the playoffs and get Kansas City another they're already successful, but another championship. Um, 
and getting that championship would be incredible to go from fifth seed to championship. Um, so here's to hoping for that. Good luck to the ladies in Houston. Um, we're all rooting for you here. Um, as we know, Kansas City is the city of champions. We love our sit. We love our sports teams around here, and uh, it's going to be a great time seeing uh, seeing another team of ours square off in the playoffs. Um, if you can find a TV station to watch it, I think it's on CBS uh, mostly. So if you can, October sixteenth at four. Go, go turn on your TV set and watch these. Um, I know that's college football and or actually it would be NFL because that's a Sunday. Um, but these ladies still deserve your your attention. Um, so if you can just switch off between those late games on Sunday and turn it in, it, yeah. All you gotta do is just switch it between the late games and, um, oh, we had a um, quick release here. Uh, U.S. soccer investigation into the women's game finds systemic abuse and misconduct. What a time to trick that to come up on my phone. Um, you know, we've been talking about it for a long time, uh, the stigma of women's sports, and, uh, I don't want to say that this wasn't expected, um, unfortunately, and it's it's kind of just sickening to to read that and to know that the highest power in U.S. soccer um, has that problem. It just is systemic abuse. And misconduct. Uh, most people know what that means, I would hope, and uh, it it shows that you know sports are a great, great thing, but it can also be a very, very, very bad thing as well. Um, and that kind of segments into my last little bit. Uh, here we're gonna cut it off here in a few seconds. I do have to get to work um, But that goes back to the NFL and to a tonga below Yeah, to a tonga by law um, It's uh, It's not to the same tree per se because it's not necessarily abuse Um I'll talk more on that as I learn more details on it. Um, but, man, Tua, as someone that has suffered head trauma before, that that just made me cringe everywhere. That entire situation really did. Um, to know that these guys are not being taken care of to the best of medical... Uh, to the best of the abilities of medical professionals. Um, if they're even being taken care of by medical professionals at all, even. Um, it just goes to show you without care and empathy, money doesn't mean anything. I mean, it's, 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 it's basically exploitation. Um, and to have a situation such as that where you're putting a player's life on the line for a regular season game even it it wouldn't matter if it were play, playoffs or a uh, regular season he shouldn't have gone in in the first place uh, it, he should have been taken out against the bills and uh, no matter how much he was kicking and screaming that's what needed to happen when you are concussed, you do not have the ability to think for yourself, at least in the entire 100%. Um, and I, even myself, one of my concussions was, oh, I can go back in, I can go back in, I promise, I'm fine, I'm fine. 
No, you're not. Um, if you're stumbling, if you're discombobulated, if you're off balance, that more than likely means that you've got head trauma and it needs to be checked out. Uh, otherwise, you're risking your life. I mean, you truly are. And to the doctors of the Miami Dolphins, what are you doing? What are you doing? Um, I don't know if the concussion protocol needs to be looked at and reviewed or the conduct of these doctors needs to be reviewed. Probably both. But it's just sickening to see that pro sports, yes, it's pro sports, so it's a business. But it's not a business of exploitation. It should never have been. Um, and it should never be. I, I think these players deserve the best benefits that they can get. And yet we're not seeing that with the NFL. Well, they could afford their own health insurance making multi-millions of dollars. That may be true. But the NFL should still offer the option of having that insurance and uh, because medical bills can get astronomically expensive and uh, it's just tough to see that the NFL it's kind of a sign that the NFL doesn't actually care about their players um with just the image of their players and uh, the image that was presented last Thursday night was an image that was just completely and utterly uncalled for, preventable, and just outright gruesome. Um, yeah, I mean, he was in a fencing pose. That's not something you get when you have a back injury or when you have an ankle injury. That's something you get when you have severe head trauma. So... I'll end it with that. Again, I know it's not KC Sports, but... It's the NFL as a whole. Um, it pertains to the NFL as a whole. And I hope that the guys that got concussions this past week, because boy, howdy, there were a lot of them. Uh, I hope that they can get the care and support that they need um, in order to come back from this better than ever. Um, football's a rough sport. Everybody knows that. But it's not a sport that should be without empathy. And without respect. And overall, that's exactly what we're seeing the opposite of in the NFL. So that's our show. Um, sorry to leave it on such a... It, it, sorry to leave it on such a dark note. Um, but at, yeah, I didn't put out any polls or anything like that this week. So nothing fun, unfortunately. Uh, there will be fun things this this week. Um, I gotta go over fantasy again. Um, gotta um, do the high school rankings again. I've got I've got a bunch of stuff planned um, over the next couple of days that you'll you'll like you'll like. So stay tuned. Um, but this has been the Burn KC. This has been your host Alex Blackburn. Have a great rest of your day. Um, if you're at lunch right now, hopefully it's going well. And if you're staying past your lunchtime, get back to work. You know, you, you be a good employee now. Get back to work. Burns Casey says so. Get back to work. We're over. It's, it's, it's done. The show's over. Anyway. This is Alex Blackburn signing off. Have a great day and a great week.